if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We are continuing today a series that we have been working on for 500 years. Um, so this is the 500th year of the Reformation. You say, well, what day is that? It's Halloween. So that is Reformation Day. Um, so we are going to remind ourselves of five basics of our faith. So before we start, or as we start youth, wake up. If I hear you snoring or drooling, you are mine. Right? Um, I'm not that nice of a person. I will walk down there. Um, our youth had a disciple now this weekend, and it was fabulous, phenomenal from what I heard. But some of them, uh, really not our youth as much as our leaders, are, it's, a, it's a wearing on them this morning. So if I hear snoring, and I, my promise to you, youth, is if your leader snores, it's game on. Right? That is, that is my promise to you guys. But we, we appreciate what the Lord is doing in our youth. Amazing things are, are happening with our young adults. And we are so proud of what God uh, is doing in their lives because they've opened their heart to the Spirit. Um, today we are going to look at this truth in our life, a basic defining principle of our faith. It is Christ alone. Christ alone. We, several weeks ago we looked at faith alone. And last week none of you showed up to church um, slackers, but we were going to look at the Word of God. Scripture alone is our defining guide and principle. I actually, some of you did show up. You actually showed up when the pastor did not. So, um, congratulations! Proud of you for that. Um, and then we are going to look at the glory of God alone, and then grace alone. These are these are tenets that ground who we are in, as in Christians, as Christians. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, his word alone, and then the glory of God alone. And to define this, to demonstrate what this might look like, I have a story that's related by one of our former presidents. Uh, Jimmy Carter, when he was inaugurated as president, that same year had the uh, privilege of speaking at the Southern Baptist Convention with 17,000 delegates. And, and the stipulation was... You have five minutes to speak. And so along with Jimmy Carter was a man you might have heard of named Billy Graham. Billy Graham was speaking first. And in between the two speakers and sitting between them on the front row was a truck driver. And as Billy Graham is eloquently waxing on the gospel, the truck driver leans over to this president and says, I'm scared to death. I have never given a speech before. Can you imagine turning to the president and saying, look, I, I've never spoken. Um, I don't know what the CIA agents were doing or the Secret Service at that point. And he's, he, ter he tells them, I am terrified. And so this, the second man to speak is the truck driver. And he gets up and he's stumbling over his, his self and his words. And he stands up before these 17,000 delegates and he, he's silent. And this is what he says. He said, I was always drunk and didn't have any friends. The only people I knew were men like me who hung around in bars in the town where I lived. And he said, but a man shared the good news of Jesus with me. And he said, I opened my heart to the gospel and the invitation of grace um, gave me new life. And in his words, he says, I wanted to tell others. But the only place I knew was the, the bar room. So I went back to the bar room and told the bartender about who I'd found. His name is Jesus Christ. And of course, the bartender said, this is not good for business. You can't do that here. But he would go back every night sharing with his friends. He said, look, I need to tell you about someone. His name is Jesus. That's the only thing I know. It's only Christ. And they would ask him questions that he couldn't answer. So he would go back home and go to his Bible. And he stood up before the crowd and he said this. He said, I don't know much. But he said, because I found Jesus, 14 of my friends have also found him. And this is what Jimmy Carter wrote. He said, the truck driver's speech, of course, was the highlight of the convention. I don't believe anyone who was there will ever forget that five-minute fumbling statement. Or remember what I or even Billy Graham had to say. This man got up and said, I don't know anything but Jesus. But, but what I do have, I'm going to share. And with that, let's look at Paul's words. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Oh, that we would be like this truck driver today. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. And that is my prayer for us, that we would see a demonstration of the power of Jesus Christ in our midst today. Let's pray, Father. Lord, may the beat of our heart and the confession of our mouth be that we know nothing except Christ and him alone. So, Lord, open our minds to your truth. Lord, we confess that we can know nothing without your wisdom. So, Lord, fill us with your knowledge that we would not be puffed up, but that we would be unleashed into the world that so desperately needs to know Christ and him alone. So, Lord, we are here today to celebrate your goodness, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. Uh, I have several points today, and we're going to begin with this overarching thought with with human wisdom, and it actually is a divergence point from 1 Corinthians 2, but it'll make a lot of sense later. And it's faith in human wisdom. God is reminding us we should not put our faith in wisdom that comes from us. Because that is a faulty platform. And when I say us, I mean church people. And and we're going to see that shortly. The truth of Scripture wakes us up to this stark reality, as Paul says in verse 4 and 5. He says, I do not want your faith to be based on whose wisdom? Human wisdom. Everyone here has a belief in something. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a system of faith and belief. And you say, well, I don't have faith in anything. You do. You just told me what that was. Right? And so the idea, well, I just, I can't have faith. We all have faith. Some of our faith are misappropriated. But we all have faith. And you say, well, what does my faith look like? How are you living? How are you living? If you lose your house because of an earthquake or a tornado or a wildfire, as in California, and if your life crumbles because you have lost your home, guess where your faith and your belief lies? In your provision and your protection. If you get sick and your life is destroyed, you say, well, Lord, how could this happen? How could you do to this, this to me? Is your faith in Christ or is your faith in your health. And we have many things that we put our faith in. But even if you cannot articulate your worldview, your life is a demonstration of your internal faith. And the factors that shape most of our faith and belief are these. Faith from your family. Faith from your culture. Faith from life. Life circumstances and also belief that is given to you by your church. And so what do you truly believe in? I think that our dominant views in society are succinctly summed up in in a story that Jesus Christ gives in Luke chapter 15. Um, He gives a series of three stories to church people. Because sometimes church people struggle with... um, Easy concepts, and so Jesus tells the same story really three times, and he gives a story of something that was lost. He said, there's all these sheep, 99 know what they're doing, they're eating, they're, they're happy sheep, and then one just decides to right, take a detour. And he says, the, the good shepherd is the one who leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one. And the church people are like, well, why would he do that? Why not focus on the 99? Like the, the one sheep, he's doing his own thing. Let him get hurt. That's what he deserves. And he said, oh, let me give you another story. There was a woman who lost a coin, and it was a valuable coin. And she searched the whole house. 
when she found that lost coin, guess what she did in the middle of the night? She wakes up her neighbors and she rejoices because what was lost is now found. And the Pharisees are thinking, okay, um, maybe there's something to this. And then he says this. He said, there's a man that had two sons. Um, and and we've, we've renamed the story incorrectly. We've renamed the story the prodigal of the or the, the prodigal son, or the prodigal of the lost son. That's incorrect. This is the story. There was a father who had not one son, but two sons. And the youngest brother was decided he, he would rather have his father's stuff than his father's grace and presence. And he said, Dad, I know you haven't died yet, and I don't really want to wait till you die. Can you give me what is owed and let me go live my life? We call this the worldview of self-discovery. If I just get, if I can throw off the, the hindrance of tra- tradition and all these rules that are on me, if I can just do what I want to and, and really chart my own course, then I will find fulfillment. So don't tell me what to do and I won't tell you what to do. Let me just go live my life. Eat, drink, and be merry. The worldview of inclusivism. And the dad says, okay, here you go. Here's your, here's your inheritance. And he goes and he's, he's lavishly, extravagantly foolish. And he ends up um, spending way too much on his credit cards. He ends up bankrupt and with the pigs. And the Bible says in Luke 15, he wakes up. Like he comes to, the Bible says he comes to his senses. And he says, look, I'm starving And even the servants in my father's house eat better than I am. I just want to go back and be a servant, not a son. I want to go back and be a servant. But the story doesn't end there. There's another son. And the other son is not in self-discovery mode. He is in moral conformity mode. He's the older brother. He's like, Dad, I'm going to do what you want me to do. And he does. And so when the younger brother comes back and Dad takes him into the house, older brother has issues with that. So I've done everything that you want me to, Father. And yet this scoundrel, the one who spent his money on prostitutes, which is never validated by the biblical text, he might have chosen, that might be true, or he might have just found the worst thing he could think of. He said, I've obeyed everything and you haven't even killed a goat for me. See, I think that these represent our two predominant worldviews. One son was lost because he didn't want the father and he ran away. But the other son was lost because he didn't truly want the father. He just felt like by doing laws and doing ritual that the father would owe him something. So the father had two lost sons. And I think in our lives, we both swing this pendulum back and forth, don't we? We see this in many of our youth and and some of you have experienced this. We call it the, the phase But truly what it is, is we say people go off to college and they do the college thing. What is that, by the way? The college thing, right? Um, And many of us, some of you are shaking your heads because that was you. And what truly has happened, you grew up in a regimented household in church and you truly fully didn't understand God's grace. You felt like if I just do these things, I'll be righteous. And you get to college and you're like, woohoo, I don't have to do this stuff. Mom's not waking me up for church. So you know what? We're having church in bed today. And, and you know, I know I was kind of sneaking around doing things and, and coming back in the house. I don't have to sneak around anymore. So I'm just going to do what I want to. And so we, we go from living a worldview or a belief system by I'm righteous because what I do and now say I'm just going to live my own life. And both lead to destruction. Both lead to devastation. About the way of self-discovery, H.R. Neighbor said this about liberalism and self-discovery. That this view proclaims and worships a God without wrath who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. This is the view that God is a God of love and so it doesn't matter what you do. You just find out who you are, go. And how foolish are we when we live that way? Some of you are like, amen, right? Those those liberal people, they're just eating and drinking and how dare they? They're playing with the pigs. 
But don't forget there's another lost son. And this man who sought his own salvation by moral conformity believed this. He believed that he was chosen by God and he could maintain his blessing and receive final salvation through strict obedience to the Bible. He believed that by putting the will of God into the standards of the community, he would find salvation. Church, we cannot legislate morality and salvation. We cannot. You say, well, yes, we can. Okay, who of you don't speed because there's a speed limit, right? I mean, it says 70. Some of you are thinking, look, there's a governor at 120. Let's see how fast it will go. We can't legislate morality and we can't legislate salvation. Now, should we conform to God's standards? Absolutely. But we conform to God's standards because he's changed our hearts, not the opposite. And how foolish are we to portray this to a world that so desperately needs to know that Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. I believe there's also a thorough third worldview that I've made up, but it works. So don't Google this. Um, I believe it's a worldview of hurt. As I was praying over our church and our service this week, I, I tried to avoid this, and it just kept coming to my mind. I'm like, Lord, it's not even a worldview. You just want me to make it up? Um, but I've turned it the worldview of hurt. Because I believe there are people here that you've been hurt deeply by someone in church or someone who wielded the acts of the Bible and they have deeply scarred you in the name of Christ and it really wasn't for the sake of Christ. I was talking to a lady last week and her, the leadership in her church just let her down in a major way. 15 years ago, And she has wandered away from worship because of the deep scar that someone left in her life. She's living a life of hurt. And some of you I know are bearing scars. If you've had people, teachers, fathers, moms, pastors that have told you, you will amount to nothing. And you're still holding on to that. Uh, I want you to know, first of all, that is a lie. Do not believe that. Because when we live a life in Christ, he radically changes our beliefs. And that is a lie that Satan's going to throw up in your face. Satan's going to say, don't you remember that time you sinned? You can't do anything anymore. We can look at Satan and say, look, I'm a simple guy. I don't know anything, Satan, except this. I know Christ and he was crucified for me. And because he was crucified for me, I have a new identity. I have a new worldview. And his name is Jesus. So let's look at the, not the folly of our wisdom. Now let's look at the faith in Christ alone. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2. Paul says this, who is a very wise man, by the way. Paul is no dummy. He's probably one of the smartest men that have ever lived. And he says this, I have not come to you with brilliance of speech or wisdom. But verse 2, I have decided to know nothing. Nothing except what? Except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the declaration of the gospel in our life. And let's unpack that gospel. What is, what is Christ? Who is he? What has he done for us? It begins this way. Genesis, the first book in the Bible, begins at creation. John, the gospel of John, begins this way. In the beginning was the word. It begins with creation. Romans chapter 1 says that we have seen the the glory of God through creation. His invisible attributes are tangible in creation. So let's begin with creation. God created the heavens and the earth. And there's a scheme that we see in in Scripture that he created the, the lights and then the sky and then the land. And then he hung sun and moon and stars in the light area, and he made birds for the sky area, and then he made things for the land area, and we call those things the beast of the sea, everything that creeps on the land, and we call them humans. You see, the crown jewel of creation is you and I. We are the defining jewel on the crown of creation. And I know that's difficult to believe, 
But God has made us in his image. In the image of him, he made them man, male and female to have dominion. And because he has created us in his image, God declared that everything was good. He created the lights and he said that they were good. And he created the sky and he said that it was good. And he created the, he separated the, the waters from the land. He said that it was good. And he created the sun, moon, and the stars. And he said that they were good. And he created the birds and everything that flies in the air. And he said that it was good. And then he filled the land with people and things and dogs and cats and all sorts of other animals, elephants and tigers and bears and bulldogs and all sorts of things that we love. And, and God said it was good. I heard great. And he created those things for his glory. But the story doesn't end there because with creation also comes a fall. And God tasked humanity. He said, look, everything you can eat of except this. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And through circumstance and happenstance and the, the feeble nature of humanity, our great, great, great ancestors, Adam and Eve, sinned. And because of that one sin, creation is now broken and fallen. And you know what they passed on to you and I? The same broken, sinful nature. And before you blame them, it is not their fault, but it's definitely, they are part of that. Because the Bible says that we all have now sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's easy to look around and see the brokenness. It's easy to see the people who are dying right now because of the wildfires. It's easy to see people who go up to the hotel and shoot those that are going to a country music concert. And it's, and it's interesting to see the world struggle through brokenness. I mean, there are, I've heard different theories of what happened. I've heard that he was mentally ill. I, I knew that was coming. Or we don't call it sin, call it mental illness. And that might be a part. But the deepest part is sin, which means we could be there because we have hatred. And I've heard people say this because the world struggles with brokenness and how we define that and how we relate to our creator. I've heard people say, well, he shot because it was a country, country music concert. I'm like, really? I've heard people say, well, he shot into that crowd because they had these political leanings. Really? Well, he had gambling debts. Really? We, we'll call it anything, but don't call it sin. Don't call it brokenness because that hits too close to home. And the Bible says, but there is hope because there is a rescuer and his name is Jesus Christ. And this is what the rescuer did. God, for the foundation of the world, knew that we would fall from creation and he made a way for us to go back into paradise, back into relationship because you see, we're broken and our relationship with God is broken. God is love, but he's also a just God. So everyone doesn't win in the end. The power of the gospel is the power of God to salvation to all who believe. Not who, not who feel love or feel good or go to church, all who believe. And so Jesus Christ came to this world that was broken and went to the cross. And look what Paul says in verse 2. He says, I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ. But he doesn't end there. What does he add on to that? What does he tag on to this phrase of the rescuer? The Jesus Christ who was crucified. That is the most scandalous thing that Paul could write to anyone in the Roman world. Because those who were crucified died. Why? Because they deserve death. And they deserved death because they were often criminals. And you know how you died on the cross? Beaten, naked, and ashamed. You know, what would be worse than dying publicly? Dying publicly and being naked. What would be worse than dying publicly and being naked? Well, being between two criminals. Um, how about on a cross where there is extreme pain? 
And then how about putting that cross on not a hill far away? We, we think he was like in an isolated little hill that no one knew. This was a major thoroughfare. Think I-20. They crucified him at the Brompton exits. Think, think about that. This, this was catastrophic and scandalous. Why would Paul remind us of the worst thing that would ever happen? Because there is power in the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you believe this, and I know some of you are thinking that, I don't believe that. I'm praying that you will. Because I do. And if you believe in the resurrection, there will be redemption and God will restore your relationship through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the power of the gospel. This is how we are called to live. The good news does not end on the cross. Because three days later, our Savior rose again. And we can't just gloss over that. Like, try to, try to visualize that. I'm a pastor, so I'm at a lot of gravesides. I have never once gone to the graveside thinking, this guy is about to raise from the dead, and it's, it's going to get hairy. We, we say that, but think of the transformation that it took for a man three days later to rise from the dead. That is only the power of Jesus Christ. And that is the same power he offers to us through his Spirit. And because of that, we can declare to live as Christ, to die as gain. Well, what are you going to do? Win, win. You might, you might hear it this way. Satan, game, set, match. Because the cross was not the end. He rose again. And may this be our declaration. So if our desire and our hope will be people that are now living Christ alone lives. To be people who say, I don't know much, but what I do know is Christ and him alone. How do we live this out? I want to focus the rest of our attention on how we live this out. Look at verse 5. We live in a way that your faith is not based on human wisdom, but on God's power. That your faith would be based on human wisdom, not on human wisdom, but on God's power. Let me say this as we look at some application. To the former older brothers in the room, to the guys that like wearing three-piece suits and doing church because it's easy and comfortable, that's me. I believe that's why God has called me to an established church. I grew up in church. I like rules. I follow rules. And God has radically saved me from that false righteousness. For those of you who are like me and you like being the older brother because it's easy, do not go back. Never add to the gospel. Be a person that says, I only want to know Christ and him alone. Don't say, look, come to faith in Jesus Christ and then get baptized. And then do this and then do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. You say this. If you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, now walk in his ways. And let the Holy Spirit drive our obedience. If you are the older brother, do not go back. It's not worth it. It will only lead to bitterness. The older brother lived in the father's house and did not love him, did not want him. The older brother felt like he had the right for his prayers to be answered. That I've obeyed you. You have to listen to me. Father, I've done church. You have to give me a good life. You have to do this. That is not the heavenly father. If you are the younger brother, do not subtract from the gospel. Do not say, well, you know what? Jesus died for everyone. It doesn't matter. Live it up. May you say, that we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And I just ask if you are on one of those spectrums this morning, that you would spend time right now confessing your weakness. And say, God, you know I'm prone to this. But Lord, you saved me from this worldview. You saved me from this false belief. Lord, do not let me go back. Do not let me go back to the chains that are in my life. May we know Christ and him alone. So what does a Christ alone life look like? 
I've written some simple thoughts as we go to the world and tell them that Jesus is all we need. The first is hope. A Christ alone life is a life of hope. The Bible says we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus says when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, I know we wouldn't have that, but if we did, when you hear of these things, he says, do not be anxious. Have hope. Don't look up. Don't watch your cable news and say the sky is falling. Jesus said this was going to happen. And Jesus says, be a person of hope. Because those who don't know Christ look up and say, what's going on? We look up and say, Jesus, you told us about this. And thankfully you're coming back. Have hope. George Hebert said this. And this is a great quote for Baptist people. He who lives in hope dances without music. He who lives in hope dances without music. Um, that's something that, that hits me to the heart because um, I will, um, my, the staff kind of makes fun of me because they know I'm on the move when I start singing. And they just now confess this to me. So they knew that they would have to, they knew I was coming in their office when they'd hear me sing. There's always a song in my mind or my heart and I've given that to my kids. I can't ever get the lyrics right to any song, but I'll just sing. So I'll make up lyrics. Like, and 70 years from now, I'm going to be Uncle Cy. That's going to be me. I'm warning you right now. I'm going to be somewhat hip and really way in left field. But there's always a song because we have hope. We, we should be able to dance. It's okay. Live a life where people say, what? look, you're weird. What's wrong? The world's burning and yet there's something different about you. And we can say, I don't know what it is, but I know his name. His name is Jesus. Be people of hope. A Christ-filled life is a person of hope. Uh, we should be people of repentance. Repentance. And you say, well, that, you just kind of threw a wet blanket on this hope thing. No, repentance is a life that is dedicated to Christ alone, marked by a holy sorrow. And why repentance? Because repentance always leads, repentance from Christ always leads us to the throne. Why would it do that? Because I know that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. So that doesn't push me away from the throne. That brings me to the throne. The world doesn't want to see that you're perfect. The world wants to see that when you fall, you are quick to repent. Quick to repent. That is a son who knows the father. That is a son who wakes up in the mud and says, look, even the slaves in the father's house have it better than this. And I know he's gracious. Oh, that we would be people of repentance. And why repentance? Because with repentance brings forgiveness and with forgiveness brings freedom. So the quicker I repent, the quicker I am forgiven and the quicker I have freedom. See how that works? So if there are chains in here today, you haven't yet confessed. Be quick to repent to the Savior. Thirdly, I believe that we, Christ alone people, should be people of trust. People of trust. What is trust? Trust is a still, quiet confidence in Jesus Christ. Trust is Paul saying, I know nothing except Jesus Christ. And hey, Romans, he was crucified. You mock him, but I trust in him. World, you're going to take him from the public square. That's okay. I still trust. You're going to ridicule him. You're going to believe in rational humanism. You're going to say, if we can't verify it, we don't believe it. Well, I can't verify that view, by the way. And I believe that Christ rose from the dead. I can't prove it, but I know what he's done in my life. And I'm going to go to my grave believing and having a trust that when I go to my grave, he's going to raise me again one day. And I'm going to be six foot five, <laughs> strong and muscular with a voice the angels would be jealous of with a cowbell that would hurt all your ears. <laughs> I, you know, I promised the Lord I was going to make a football reference, but sorry, Lord. But that's the confidence we need, isn't it? We need to be people that say, to live is Christ. And if I die, to die is gain. So what are you going to do? Kill me? You're going to speed up my hallelujahs. And if you leave me here on earth, I'm going to be a person that says, I don't know much, 
but I will know Christ and him alone because I trust in him. We need that trust. We also need to be people of this. People who are Christ alone are known what they're for, not what they're against. That hits home, doesn't it? We need to be known what we're for and not against. Listen, Paul says this, verse two, I have decided to know nothing. What is Paul against here? I don't know. He didn't tell me. But what is he for? Jesus Christ and him alone. Listen, I can spend a hundred years telling you what I'm against and lose your soul. But if I tell you about Jesus Christ, we get to spend eternity talking about the one who can save us. What is my opinion compared to the good news of Jesus? I have a lot of opinions. Almost all of them stink. What is my preference compared to the glory of the resurrection? Oh, that we would be people who, who tell the world, look, we're not worried about what we're against. I'm for Christ against sin. And I'll let the Holy Spirit bring that conviction because he's doing it in my life. But we want you to know that we are for Christ. And if we are people who are known for what we're for, you're gonna be very uncomfortable because you're gonna have people that sit next to you that don't look like you, that are struggling with sin. And you're gonna wanna go big brother on them and say, get your act, I know you were with the pigs. Dad knows you're with the pigs. Are you the only one that doesn't know you're with the pigs? And the Holy Spirit's gonna say, hush your mouth. Give them Jesus. Tell them there's grace and mercy. And, and the Holy Spirit will clean up the mud. And when that happens, then when you turn around, they can help clean up the mud that's still on your back. Because we're in this together. And unless I haven't met someone, you might be new today. We don't have any perfect people here that I've met, including the one I saw in the mirror this morning. We need to be people who are known for what we're for. The world says, you guys don't like this, 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 and this. We need to say, well, let's wipe the slate clean. We want you to know Jesus and him crucified. Let us be known that we love Jesus Christ. And lastly, we need to be known for people who are inviting. A Christ alone life is marked by gospel invitation. A Christ alone life is marked by gospel invitation. You say, well, how do you know that? Where do you see that? Look at verse one. Brothers and sisters, I have come announcing the mystery. as a verbal proclamation, right? I have decided to know nothing among you. Verse four, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive, what, words, but with demonstration of the Spirit. Paul is saying, look, I want you to know Christ and I don't keep that in. I don't hide my light under a little bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Why do we teach kids that? And then we forget it. Like we teach our kids, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And yet we go out there and we're hiding that thing. We need to be inviting Invite someone to God's grace. God's grace has come to you because it is going to someone else. We are not hoarders of God's grace because we have not created God's grace. We are only conduits. We are mere beggars telling other beggars where to find the bread of life. Oh, that we would be inviting people today. Oh, that we would be like this truck driver. Some of you want to be the president. Some of you just say, well, Lord, if you would make me Billy Graham, I would speak. And God said, no, I, I just created you to, to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. The words of in Christ alone are still ringing in my ears and my heart. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or Lord willing calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Can you declare that today? We're gonna sing a song of response. Can you honestly say today, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. And maybe you're here today and you've been beaten up this week. And maybe you feel like, well, here I can kneel 
I mean, maybe in the power of Christ, I'll walk or I'll crawl. I'm gonna invite you to spend time where you sit or, or come crawl to the altar and say, Lord, I wanna stand and declare that I know nothing except Christ and him crucified. And may this time of response be a time of boldness for you. But maybe you're here today and you don't believe yet in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've put your wisdom in your thoughts, the wisdom of the world. Maybe you say, well, I'm just not a person of faith. No, you have faith. It's in the wrong person. You just haven't yet put it in Jesus. I want you to know that he died on the cross for your sins. He didn't wait for you to go to church. He actually died while you were still a sinner. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us to his own way, but yet the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity, the sins of us all. And I invite you where you sit during the time of response, where you stand, if you would confess Christ as Lord and say, Lord, I turn from myself, I can't do it, and I turn to you. I need Jesus and him alone. And we would love to celebrate with you the glorious power of the salvation that is found in only Christ alone. Let's pray.